Welcome everybody to Known Unknowns, the pros, cons and consequences of known donation. This event is in partnership with the University of Manchester's Morgan Centre for Research into Everyday Lives, thanks to funding from the ESRC and UK Research and Innovation for their Curious Connections project. PET is also grateful for sponsorship from the European Sperm Bank. Dr. Petra Nordquist is a researcher and senior lecturer at the University of Manchester's Morgan Centre for Research into Everyday Lives, and it's her team's Curious Connection pro project, which explores the impact of donating egg or sperm on the everyday lives of donors, including known donors, as well as their partners, and their parents. So what I will be sharing tonight are small quotes from research and they come from this project called the Curious Connections Project uh, which is exploring the personal life of egg and sperm donors and as you can see the link there so what, what I will be telling you is a tiny tiny portion of everything that we've discovered over the last three or so years so if you're curious to find out more it's manchester.ac.uk slash egg and sperm donors. Um, so what, as Sarah said broadly speaking donors in the UK can sort of be split in two very broad groups. Uh, identifiable donors, and as Sarah has explained, they are now traceable and identifiable and anonymity is no longer an option in the UK. But we also have these hugely varied groups of known donors and it's important to know how, just how varied they are. It's people who donate to their friends, uh, to their families, it might be brothers donating to one another, acquaintances, uh, but also via social media, online forums and so on. Uh, what they have in common though is that they have met their recipients prior to donating. Uh, but the degree to which they know each other and to which they become known to each other after donating varies hugely. It can be a one-off event, it can be a, a sort of turn into a relationship. So that's important to keep in mind. In the Curious Connection project, we have done all sorts of things. And what I'm going to be doing tonight is draw on the donor interviews. As you can see from this screen, we did 52 interviews with donors, 26 with male donors and 26 with female donors. So they are the ones I will focus on tonight. But as you can see, we have an awful lot of data in the project. Uh, I will make two key points and I'm sorry to be rushing, but I have eight minutes. So my key points are to explore three themes in particular that I think are important uh, in, in terms of tonight's discussion about what our research tells us about known donors and their experiences. And two, what we think this might tell us about the future of identity release donation and how relevant uh, our findings might be to understand what, what will happen after 2023 when donor conceived children may, when the, when the HFA may op will open the register. So, so, as I said, I will share three sort of key discoveries from the project. The first one of those is a really, really strong finding, which was uh, paramount between identity release donors as well as known donors, is that donors do not see themselves as parents. They are extremely careful uh, to not to, um, and it's a very sort of moral understanding actually that they are not parents, do they, they do not want to thread on parents' toes, they do not want to interfere in families. Andy was a known donor and you can see the quote here, it's not his real name, none of these are real names. So Andy's quote was quite typical, he donated to a couple, he said when the baby was born he left it four to five weeks, he, did, he wanted to give the child plenty of time to bond with the mum. He wanted to show the family the respect. He didn't want to feel like he was interfering. He didn't want them to think he was interfering. Um, and they are doing all the hard work, all the sleepless nights. And that kind of notion of, of actually doing the work of parenting was lots of donors uh, mentioned that. However, there is some sense of connection, nevertheless. So donors do not see themselves as parents, but there is a sense of connection with the recipient and their family. Some donors felt this quite strongly and spoke about it as a, as a sort of affinity with a person. Others spoke more of having a sort of sense of perhaps a certain responsibility towards the donor conceived person in particular. All the known donors we spoke to spoke of sensing this connection and, and because of it, a need to sort of carefully manage the relationships that would sort of grow from a known donation. Uh, but it was also common actually amongst the ID release donors, so bearing in mind these are people who's never met their recipients, never met the child, they also sprung of sensing this kind of connection. So for example, Ian and Kyle were two of the known donors we interviewed, and do feel free to read this quote in full. 
Uh, but Ian says towards the very end of this quote, which I think is a lovely quote, he says, being a donor gives you part to a very intimate part of their family, his recipient's family, without actually having to be part of their family. So he was talking here of people he had lost contact with, but nevertheless, they, he had this kind of place in their minds and in their, in their family. Kyle put it a bit more succinctly, he just said, it's intense. Uh, Karina was an ID release donor, and, but also spoke of this kind of sense of connection. So she said when she did uh, the injections for egg retrieval, and she was thinking, wow, I'm really doing this for a stranger. But she said after having done the retrieval, it didn't feel like I was doing it for a stranger anymore. So these connections, they come with a sort of charge. They are not nothing, They're, there is something. They, ca they carry meaning and they carry a kind of emotional charge. And that charge can be very, feel to be very, very positive and very joyous and rewarding. And indeed, many of the known donors we interviewed talked about wanting to be known donors because they wanted that joyous and rewarding relationship. But by the same token, by this charge, it can also turn to be, become a negative relationship, a sort of toxic and feeling to be very devastating, disturbing even. Um, so the known donor relationships, what we found was that we, these relationships could sort of really ebb and flow over time. And the known donors spoke of the inability to actually tell what kind of relationship this would become or what would grow from being a known donor. It might be a friendship, it might be a family relationship, but it all depended on, as in, as in human relationships, who was involved and who the, who the people were. Uh, but when the relationship did grow, it grew around that sense of having a connection. Um, and that, but as I said, that connection could give rise to a relationship that could be felt to be deeply rewarding and at times deeply um, difficult. So we found both at, at the time of the, when we interviewed donors, we found people at, at both kind of both of the highs and the lows of that experience. So Beth, for example, said it brings me so much pressure to know. Fred, who had donated to a male friend and his female partner, said over time relationships have become really strained, and he was now talking it as a kind of heartbreak in his life. So what do we then think that this can tell us about the future of ID release donation? Well, as Sarah said in the beginning, in 2023, we have this point in time when donor-conceived young people will be able to uh, make contact and identify their donors. And at that point, of course, some kind of personal knowledge of each other will start to grow and possibly relationships will form. But how will they make sense of this connection, the people involved? What kind of relationship will grow and what will happen if and when people disagree on the terms of the relationship? Obviously, we don't know what the future will bring, um, but I think our findings and we think our findings provide something of a roadmap for what, what might come. So we, we are likely, I think, to see some sense of a connection uh, being there. Um, it's also likely we think that these relationships won't be nothing. There will be something there, a high sort of emotional charge potentially. And potentially we will see the same sort of ebbs and flows that we also have seen uh, and do see in known in age in, in sorry in known donation but of course the key difference when it comes to id release donation really is that at no point has donors and recipients chosen one another and also they have never rejected one another uh, um, before a baby was conceived and so the stakes in the ground may be very high indeed thank you very much our next speaker this evening is going to be, um, sorry for a moment, I've, um, is Natasha Fox. And Natasha is a donor conceived person. She is the daughter of the first person in Scotland to access IVF treatment as a single woman. So good evening everyone. My name's Natasha and I'm going to talk about my life and experience growing up to, as a donor conceived person. From the outset, I'd like to say that I think my experience is inextricably linked to my perspective of growing up in a proud single parent family, um, knowing about my circumstances from a very young age and always being curious about my unknown donor. So at 28, after eight years of dealing with ovarian cysts, my mom sought fertility treatment while she still could. But despite having only one ovary, she was refused treatment in Scotland because she was not married. She was reassured by the medical professionals that her prince would come and that she was too young to know her own mind. I've included on the screen there a letter my mum received from a, a consultant that refused to treat her. Um, and he writes, I urge you once again to consider the position and prospects of any baby born to you out of wedlock by donor insemination. 
After years of patronizing moral judgments, my mom finally found some medical judgment and some support in Eastbourne. 12 cycles later and a lot of debt, I was the wee pink line in her pregnancy test. I'm really glad that attitudes have softened towards single parent families and that society understands that families are more than the nuclear family and it's just about love and it doesn't matter about shape or size. However, I think it's important that we remember now in 2020 that in 1992, societal attitudes towards single mothers, um, let alone single mothers by choice, was not as supportive. I've included an example, the year I was born, uh, the government of the day famously described single mums as young ladies who get pregnant just to jump the housing queue. As far back as I can remember, I've always known I was donor conceived. For my second birthday, my mum made me a storybook about a special little girl. This 10 page book shows my family and my friends what I like to do at nursery and it explains how I came to be. As a result, the doctor helped make me became the way I understood and described my circumstances. Growing up, I was always open and confident when telling our family story. Although a six year old talking about exploding ovaries wasn't always the answer parents expected when they were inquiring in the playground, where's your daddy? By 1999, we had moved from London to Scotland and my mum continued her fertility treatment, which made her the first single woman in Scotland to receive such treatment, 11 years after she was first rejected. The media were very interested in us. And as a seven-year-old, I remember enjoying the photo shoots where I got to play in the park and the kind words of teachers when they saw me in the papers. I felt special. I had no idea my mum was receiving hate mail and was the subject of nasty articles and backlash, some of which you can see here. My papa kept every article my mum was mentioned in at this time, for good or bad. There were so many I couldn't include them all in one slide, so here's an example. Um, my favourite one is when my mum is mentioned in the same sentence as Madonna um, in a Times article that was titled, Women Behaving Disgracefully. As I grew older, my curiosity about my donor increased. I will always remember my mum saying, there is one thing we do know for sure, and that is that he must be a very kind person and that you definitely got the messy gene from him. I actually recently found letters I wrote when I was 10 years old. I wrote to Emmeline Pankhurst, Rosa Parks, Nelson Mandela, and funnily enough, I wrote to my donor. Although I can't remember writing this specific letter you see in front of you, I think it shows through my semi-legible handwriting that my un as my understanding of my circumstances sharpened, so did my curiosity. I understood that the law would not let me have information, but writing to my donor always made me feel satisfied that I had achieved something when I became frustrated or sad at lack of answers. Even though my mom never sent these letters, I always felt better and went back to contently watching Sabrina the Teenage Witch. In 2005, the law changed. I knew it did not apply to me, but I remember feeling the unfair sting of being left out. Every time a policy was changed, I would see our picture in the paper again and experience a kind flurry of curiosity at school. And you've got an example in front of you there. Fast forward to 2010, and I'm counting down the days until my 18th birthday. Finding out those tiny pieces of information about my donor was so important to me. Therefore, I was delighted to see that he had provided additional information, not just the mandatory height, eye color, and blood type. He described himself as chatty, bright, and extrovert, saying he was interested in the arts and theater and that he was the director and manager of a theater. I was obsessed with the arts and theater, so that felt really special. These small nuggets of information increased my curiosity even further. After much back and forth with the HFEA, asking them what steps they had taken to promote the change in law, I was always disheartened by their lack of action and consequently the disappointingly low re-registration rate. 
So before my 21st birthday, I decided to write how I felt about not knowing who my donor was in the hopes that he would read it and re-register. Some donors did read my article and re-registered and wrote articles themselves saying how my piece helped. My article was uh, actually led to quite a few interviews, um, but I was taken aback by the questions. I was asked, can families be families without fathers? Are you happy your mom had you without a dad? Or do you agree with your mom's decision by BBC, you know, all the TV channels? I found the premise baffling, if I'm honest. Would I rather be alive not knowing who my donor is or not exist at all? One host apologized for calling me sperm donor conceived. I said that I didn't have a problem with any of those words. It was the truth. I didn't understand why people couldn't believe I could be happy and proud that I'm from a single parent family and still also be very curious about my donor. For me, the two are not mutually exclusive. I grew frustrated with what I saw as an oversimplification and polarization of these issues. So I continue to talk about my nuanced perspective. At this time, my mum released a book about her experiences and it received a lot of praise in the media. I've got some examples in front of you there. As you can see, this praise continued as the years went on. And I think this slide especially provides a stark comparison from the one that we saw in 1999. By 2018, with my curiosity still unwavering, I took a DNA kit in the hopes I would find a distant cousin maybe from my donor's side. Instead, I found a half sister older than me who thankfully knew she was donor conceived. She lives in America and we have managed to meet up three times and we chat frequently. She's a lovely, smart person. And as an only child, I feel very lucky to have met her. We know that we have at least four other half siblings, all younger, uh, who have not yet registered with the donor sibling network. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, uh, but I also understand that maybe they are not curious the way that I am. This year, the BBC asked me to share my experience of using a DNA website and finding my half sister. Despite potential internet trolls, I agreed as I wanted to tell a positive story that helped raise awareness about the change in law now 15 years old. I also hoped it would help me find out more about a kind donor with an interest in arts and theatre. Thanks. Our next speaker is Nina Barnsley from the Donor Conception Network. Nina is the director of the Donor Conception Network, a parent-led, child-focused organisation which has been supporting donor conception families for over 25 years. Um, so um, she's got a lot to add to this discussion. So firstly, thank you very much to PET for organising this great event and for inviting me to speak. So for this presentation, I'm going to be speaking mainly from anecdotal evidence. So that's the experiences of our members, but also the many non-members who've contacted us over the years who've used known donors. We've seen the ups and downs of those relationships over time. And from that, I think we've been able to distill some thoughts on what we see as some of the really important issues, the pros and cons of using a known donor and ideas of what can help with positive outcomes for the, for, for the families in the long term. So just to recap, a known donor is someone known to the family who's contributing sperm, eggs or embryos to help create a child, but they're not going to have a parental role in that child's life. It could be a close friend, a family member, an acquaintance or friend of friend. And they could also be a stranger before they get to know each other um, who's contacted for the specific purpose of creating that child. So, for example, meeting through Facebook or through a website. So I think it's clear that the donor in each of these circumstances will have a different history with the parents and therefore possibly different motivations for donating. 
and they may well forge very different kinds of ongoing relationships with the parents and indeed the child. So what have we seen? I think we can say that in our experience, we have lots of positive experiences and known donation can work extremely well for all parties. I think perhaps this is because so much preparation is needed and most people will have done a lot of foundational work, but also partly because there are fewer unknowns in those elements of the family story. With a donor from a clinic, that person may actually never be identified, like for Natasha, though it may, that may change that situation. Uh, they certainly, even with ID release donors, they won't be known before a child reaches adulthood or until information about them is discovered via a DNA test. Other potential genetic relations are also unknown. So the donor's siblings, parents, cousins, their own children, and of course, any half siblings in other donor conception families who've used the same donor. All of that is unknown. With a known donor, there are normally far fewer missing pieces in the jigsaw. Questions can be answered, Relationships can evolve naturally over time. Children grow up knowing about those wider connections and they can integrate all of that into their sense of identity about themselves from the start. So I think this can all make a really positive option for people who are considering donor conception as the way to have their children. I think the fact that a known donor has a name and a face is also significant. We use this term donor but it isn't familiar to most people, and it certainly isn't familiar to children. Parents often soften the language, so they'll say things like the kind egg donor lady or the nice man who gave his seed. But with a known donor, children have a picture of the person and they can say, John, he's my donor. He isn't my dad because he doesn't look after me, but he helped make me. Or they could say, my Aunt Maria gave my mum an egg because my mum's eggs weren't working. So that small addition of a name can make a really big difference and make it clear to everyone that the donor's a person. And I think other children, when children are trying to explain about their origins, can find it far easier to relate to a named individual. And I think adults probably too. I sometimes wonder whether clinics couldn't move to actually sharing a donor's name, first name, maybe their middle name if it's necessary to preserve that anonymity. So it doesn't expose their identity, but it gives that tool that can help parents and children share their family story with real confidence. So what about the things to consider, potential mishaps or problems? I think trust is at the root of a lot of it. The whole arrangement in known donation relies on a large degree of trust between the donor, the parents and the child. So that trust can be built on a historical context if the known donor is a friend or a family member. With a stranger from the internet, it may take longer, require different measures to confirm they're trustworthy and build that sense of trust. Donors who, found, who are found via websites may not always be honest and open. They may lie about other families they've helped. They may lie about the numbers of children they've created, who else has been informed that might need to know, so they may not have told a partner, for example. And sometimes in rare, I think, occasions, but it does happen, they may not even be completely honest about their motivations for donating or indeed their identity. And so all of those elements just, just are things to consider and they do, uh, they do pose a potential risk. So with a known donor, there is a different kind of risk in a way. They're right there. They're named, they're included in the family story. Potentially they're even present at birthdays and big family gatherings. So then establishing those internal boundaries, the separation between the donor and the donor's family and the parent and the child becomes really crucial. So what's important here are things around language. So John is a donor, not a dad. Aunt Maria is an aunt, despite the fact that her sister used her eggs, so she's also the genetic mother. So a known donor is not going to be parenting, and there's a task of working out what is their precise role? What are their responsibilities? What are the expectations, the commitments? 
And of course, factoring all of that, to factor all in with all of that, it's important to remember that feelings and relationships can change over time. So examples we've seen in the network, um, we've seen examples of a child born and the donor suddenly reevaluates their feelings around parenthood and they actually want to take on a parental role. Maybe there's pressure from the donor's own mother and father. The super cute baby arrives and suddenly they decide actually they'd like to be active and involved grandparents. A donor may not approve of a really significant parental decision that her parents have made. The family or the donor may move house, which impacts contact arrangements. The donor may start a new relationship with someone who doesn't feel comfortable about the arrangement and wants them to pull away. Then we've got donor conceived children. They didn't have a voice at the point when the arrangement was first established, but they may be very happy to make their opinions known as they grow up and they find that voice. We've seen children express that they would like to see their donor much more. And we've seen children express that they would like to see their donor much less. And these can be difficult things to hear and difficult situations to know what action to take. Children in solo mum and lesbian couple families, the children may start calling John, who's the donor, dad, maybe just to fit in with what other children at school are used to in terms of vocabulary. And of course, there's no other person in the family who takes that title, dad. So suddenly the line between donor and parent can potentially start to blur. So in short, things are going fine, but despite the best laid plans, often a spanner comes in the works and resolving those situations can sometimes be very difficult. Having said that, I think that it's rare that those situations don't get resolved at all. But occasionally some of the situations I've described already can become so big that they do result in a breakdown in the relationships. We've also been contacted by families where it's the partner of the donor who struggled. It can be very hard to voice negative feelings, thoughts, doubts, or simply to say no when what you're doing is potentially denying someone else their dream of a family. For a donor's partner, there can also sometimes be a sense that, well, it's not my eggs or sperm, so it's not for me to say yes or no to this. And some of the most serious problems and family breakdowns we've seen were in situations where it was the donor's partner who just wasn't comfortable with the decision and ultimately couldn't reconcile that feeling. So what are the secrets to success? I think it's easy to communicate and operate in good faith when everything's going well. The important thing is going to be to work out how you're going to operate if things are not going well. When there's disagreement, emotions running high, there's a conflict of demands and wishes that can't be easily resolved. Having an agreed process that supports those discussions, keeps them civil and productive will be vital. And it might actually be an important part of the matching process to find a donor who's willing to engage and work like that. What else? It's the usual. Preparation, preparation, more preparation. Then we want clear boundaries, ongoing dialogue, and I think one of DCN's absolutely core values, which is openness. Thank you. Our next speaker now is Erica Tranfield and Erica is the founder of and director of Pride Angel, a website connecting gamete don donors and prospective parents and she's also a mother to a donor conceived child. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the growth of the fertility industry online and I'm going to include a little bit about uh, my own personal journey of using a, a known donor. Uh, so in order to address the question um, of looking at the fertility industry online, I wanted to, I asked myself a question, and that was with the dramatic rise in the number of donors registering and recipients looking online at connection services, should we really rule out online connection services as a viable and positive way of achieving parenthood? I thought the easiest way to look at this would be to look at our statistics. We founded Pride Angel, and I should, uh, I should comment really, Pride Angel is a connection service for anybody looking for sperm donors, egg donors, or co-parents. 
actually a little bit like a dating website, but for finding a donor. So we found it in 2009. And if we have a look at some statistics here from March 2011, if we concentrate on the, on the UK, we can see that sperm donors in the UK, we have around 500 and sperm recipients we have in the region of 2,700. If we move forward to September 2017, you can see we have uh, nearly two and a half thousand sperm donors in the UK. That's up from 500. And for sperm recipients, we have just over 14 and a half thousand up from 2010. So an exponential increase in the, um, in the number of donors. If we have a look at today's date, you can see again, it's still continuing to grow. We have 4, 000, over 4,700 sperm, sperm donors and nearly 25,000 sperm recipients just in the UK. So I think if we're looking to answer the question about whether or not there is a need, I would certainly say yes, it is continuing to grow. People are considering online connection services as a viable option. If we have a look at why people might think about the advantages of known donors, there is the ability for, as Nina was saying, to get to meet the donor. You can understand the characteristics and the personality of somebody. You can ask the questions about why they want to donate. Um, you can understand a lot more. You have the ability to tell your child. Um, you can continue by having ongoing contact with that donor should you wish to do so. And it can prevent um, issues with the donor, meeting the donor later on in life. Um, when you maybe just have the, the basic information from the fertility clinic meeting somebody at the age of 18 and above, there may be quite considerable social differences. So, um, moving forward from known donors, what did we look for in our donor? Well, we, we wanted to use somebody who would be involved in our, uh, in our child's life, possibly a little bit different to what um, most people would look for. We used our own website to, to look for our donor, and we went through a series of four gentlemen in the process. Uh, the, first, the first gentleman we met was, um, we actually tried for 12 months with him and it wasn't successful. So in the end, we, um, we decided that it wasn't going to happen. So we, uh, we moved on to our next donor. Then um, donor number two, we, um, he was a very handsome donor. We would have made beautiful babies, but um, as it transpired, he was actually looking for more of a co-parenting arrangement. And it wasn't really until we spoke with Natalie Gamble and we got to the, uh, the point of putting together a, uh, a donor agreement that she actually recognized that he was looking for more of a co-parenting arrangement. So I can't emphasize enough that, um, that uh, that people should really go through um, the, all the paperwork and make sure that they do put donor agreements in place. Donor number three, his, his sperm was doing the backstroke, uh, so that wasn't going to work. And donor number four was our daughter's daddy. So when we, when we met with um, our daughter's father, we got on well. He came round and we, uh, we met at a local coffee shop. We got to know him over a period of a few months. We drew up a donor agreement, but quite interestingly, we put together a letter of intent. Now, in our letter of intent, we included, it was about five pages of A4. We included lots of information such as Christmas, um, how we intended to discipline our child, what we thought about religious context, uh, schooling, for example, we said the donor wouldn't be coming along for parents' evening, but we would be willing to share school reports with him. So we put a lot of information into the, donor, into the letter of intent, shared that with our donor, and he agreed. And um, yeah, we, we moved forward. So here is our, our daughter's father um, and our daughter sitting together. Our daughter's now two and a half. She's met daddy uh, three times, but more importantly for us, um, she, um, she's actually met her nan and granddad, which is his mum and dad. So in terms of the process, we, um, we opted personally for home insemination. We always recommend people to go down the route of a fertility clinic for the treatment. But in our case, we were quite happy to um, get the sexually transmitted diseases done, performed at home. 
to perform the, uh, the donor agreement. So we, on the first attempt, I drove to his house and picked up the specimen, came back home and we performed the insemination. And I should say that part of the reason as well why we went for home insemination was because I wanted to, um, I wanted for my wife to be putting it there. So when I was pushing out the baby, I could blame her for putting it there in the first place. So it was more personable for us. Then the, the second attempt was actually our last attempt because he told us that he was going to be moving away to Saudi Arabia. Um, so it was a little bit of a surprise for us. And I think at that point, I actually, um, I was actually willing to not have a child. And I, um, I knew that that was it. I didn't really want to look for another donor and I fell pregnant. So obviously then he told his parents, we have a great relationship with his parents. Um, because he's moved away, um, our daughter has seen his parents about 10 times. We have a very good relationship with her nanny and granddad. And it's all a very positive um, experience. So just a quick question uh, for me at the end, how can um, the fertility clinics and the powers that be really support our online industry? I think fertility clinics can help um, uh, by not being so worried and threatened by online connection services. We do um, assist in the much needed recruitment of donors. Um, we would like the process to be made much easier. I'm not necessarily a, a big fan of if you take a known donor through a fertility clinic. I don't think that um, quarantine time should be necessary. Uh, there is obviously nap testing. I think um, we, there should be more cost-effective IUI. Uh, people should be given a lot of information. On Pride Angel, we give a lot of information for people to make their own informed decisions. And I think not everybody's circumstances are the same. And although we, um, we have our donor daddy, um, and our daughter actually does call him daddy with a photo in the, in the living room, um, that's not for everybody. We realize that people's circumstances are different, but it worked um, and it is very successful for us. We'd like to make sure that people um, seek legal advice and make this more um, accessible. And it would be lovely to have a central register to, to be able to record um, all of such donations. So that now leaves me um, to introduce the final speaker um, for this evening's event, and that is Natalie Gamble. Natalie is a solicitor at NGA Law, a firm which specialises in fertility and family law. And she's also the founder of the Brilliant Beginnings, um, Brilliant Beginnings, which is a not-for-profit surrogacy agency. Well, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. It's an absolute pleasure and what a fantastic um, set of presentations we've had from, from everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the legal issues that we commonly deal with. Um, and within the, within the team at NJ Law, we deal with a lot of known donation cases. Um, and I would say that the overwhelming majority of the cases that we see involve LGBT families. So typically lesbian couples, some single women as well, who are looking for an arrangement with a known father. Um, and on the other side, a lot of men, a lot of them in, in same-sex relationships who want to be parents in some form. Um, and for some of those people, it is a, a co-parenting arrangement, not a donation arrangement, where everybody will be involved and will share parenting. But for most of them, it's something less than that. But neither is it a traditional donation arrangement. So really, um, it's something in the middle. And I think the, the difficulty that often arises is that there is this huge spectrum of the kind of arrangements that people expect and the kind of boundaries that need to be in place. Um, and so we often hear the clients that we're working with use language like somebody being an uncle figure or a significant person or a positive role model. So something less than a parent, but maybe something a bit more than a kind of traditional donor who would just give their donates, that donate their gametes and then kind of not be involved. Um, and so one of the difficulties I think is that the lack of language we have around defining what those things mean. And we've often had cases in the past where people have used that language, but each side has understood it to mean something different. So in terms of how we kind of support people who are in these sorts of known donation arrangements, um, we often do work with people at the planning stages, and this goes to Nina's preparation, 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 where we're giving advice about the law and we're helping them to work through putting a, a written agreement in place. So in terms of the legal framework, it's incredibly complex and I think much more complicated than it needs to be because the law in the UK says that a child can only have two legal parents and the rules in assisted reproduction cases to dictate who those two legal parents are are very inflexible and they're also very complicated. 
So the birth mother will always be the legal mother of the child and she will have um, full responsibility. Um, but the issues arise around who the other parent is. So it may be her partner, and that will be the case if they're married and they conceive through artificial insemination or IVF, or if they opt for the, 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 the mother's partner to be a, the second parent because they've conceived at a clinic. On the other hand, it might be the donor, um, and he may be a legal parent, for example, if he's donated through home insemination, um, and may or may not be the parent if he's donated through a clinic. So a lot depends on the circumstances, and it's not always for people to choose. Sometimes it's just about everybody's marital relationships, um, and about um, the circumstances of conception. So there may be choices for people to make about the timing of a marriage, about whether they conceive at home or at a clinic. And we think it's really important for people to be very clear about the structure that they're setting up. Um, but more widely than that, I think it would be really great if the law was more flexible. Um, and certainly we would like to see a situation in the UK where it's possible to record three or four parents on a birth certificate where the intention is um, for people to, for a child to, to have people who do identify as parents and, and act in that way. Um, it would give people more choice about the, the structure that they're setting up when they go into these arrangements. The other thing that we talk to um, about people going into these arrangements at the beginning stage is about expectations. So how is this arrangement going to work when the child's born? What kind of contact is going to happen? What will the donor be known as? Um, is he going to be daddy? Is he going to be Uncle John? You know, what's it going to be? How are decisions about the child going to be made? And I think the most important thing is to try and flush out if there are underlying mismatched expectations, because that is what sows the seed of disaster in these cases. If actually people going into to it want different things um, and as Eric has mentioned we, we often have cases where it's in the course of discussion about the agreement that that comes out so it's kind of the process of going through and um, putting things in writing that really helps to kind of avoid difficulties. So the other way in which we deal with uh, known donation cases uh, a little bit more sadly are the cases where things have gone wrong um, where we're dealing with problems and trying to get them resolved and people will often um, consult us for advice or legal representation when things have gone very badly wrong. Um, and those cases tend to fall in one of two categories. Um, the first category is disputes about whether the donor is financially responsible. Um, and those cases are, they're very kind of technical cases that come down to, is the donor the legal father? And that depends on the circumstances of conception. So it's not about intention, it's not about what the agreement says. And some donors are very shocked to find that out if they didn't get legal advice at the beginning. The other cases that we deal with are disputes about what the donor's role should be in the child's life. Should he be involved in decisions? Um, should he have more regular contact? And these are really tough and very emotional cases. Um, as I've said, they often start with those underlying mismatched expectations at the beginning, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes things just evolve in a certain way. Um, and some of the cases we deal with are the end of maybe even years of the relationship slowly breaking down. So when they get as far as court proceedings, and obviously we always try to avoid that wherever possible, but the core issue is really whether this person is a donor or a father. Um, and the courts have come up with a whole range of different outcomes. Every case is fact specific. Um, but in some cases, the court will give what they call identity contact. So, you know, the, the child has a right to know who the donor is and may have contact once or twice a year or just by letters. And in other cases, donors have been given contact and rights very similar to those of a separated father. So there's a huge kind of spectrum um, and in practice a lot to fight for um, because they're not, these cases are not treated just like um, traditional separated parent cases where there is a presumption in favour of contact. Um, so they're much more complicated and the court will look at what was intended at the beginning so the agreement may be relevant they will look at even more importantly what's happening now so what's happened since the birth what's the status quo and the overriding consideration is of course the welfare of the child um, so in terms of you know what advice I would give to people going into a known donation arrangement I think it's really important to embark on this with your eyes open you know understand the law um, you know set the structure up in the right way and take your time to explore your expectations and the other party's ex expectations as well and to put things in writing um, I think the law should be more flexible as I've mentioned so that it would facilitate people being able to make those choices and have those conversations if they had freer options to decide whether they name a donor on the birth certificate and even his partner as well um, or whether they don't because they would make them think about the way that they want to set things up from the beginning. 
Um, but I'm also conscious that, you know, there is always going to be risk in a known donation arrangement because it's involving an ongoing human relationship and human relationships involve, you know, emotions and difficulties and change and all of those things. Um, and, but despite having been the, the doom and gloom law, if you like, and talked about all these worst case scenarios, um, I mean, do I think it's uh, it's a good thing? And ultimately, yes, I do, um, because I think in known donation arrangements, you have the beauty of there being no mystery for the child. They grow up with complete openness and transparency about their genetic identity um, and frankly, more people in the world who are there to love them. And as long as the relationships are working well, then there can't be anything bad about that. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Natalie, for that whistle stop tour of the law is what we big ask in eight minutes and um, also for giving you you know some insights into your views about change etc um, so if um, the other speakers can now start turning their cameras on and rejoining us so um, welcome back to Petra Nina Natasha and Erica brilliant um, and we have loads of questions we've now got I think the number says 42 um, not all of them are questions some are a massive thumbs up for Natasha you've been very popular um, I think people really appreciated that personal touch so I'm going to start with the most popular question um, and um, so this is from um, Freddie Howell and he is a, he says he's um, an uh, pre-91 donor conceived person and he wants to know um, what research has been done to understand the viewpoint of donor conceived people and has and I suppose if it has how has this been incorporated into the current climate and um, how donation services work going forward so I think perhaps Petra if you start off answering that one and then we'll see if anyone else has got something to contribute. Thank you for that question. Um, so there has been research with donor conceived people and I think what's important to know about the research is that it's research where people are adults. And so obviously, so it's not young people, it's not uh, children taking part in their research. So we, we haven't yet researched donor conceived people as they are children or as they are under 18. So usually people who take part in those kinds of studies are people looking back who are now adults. Um, and so the law change in the UK uh, that came through and sort of came into effect in 2005 was very much informed by a perspective of a donor conceived um, adult who was who was an adult at that stage. So, uh, but that's not to say that other people can have different experiences. So that was a very powerful case who who actually shaped the law in very powerful ways. Um, so, the, but you know, it, one has to bear in mind that not everyone not everyone sort of steps forward like that not everyone shares those feelings about being donor conceived and so on so so the, the details of that those studies i think you know if you're interested you know look into them because they will be very varied and it won't be one experience um, would be my uh, suggestion does anybody else want to chip in on that one I'm seeing blank faces so I think we'll move on to the next one which is a really um, quite a personal um, question um, and that is some, from someone who is currently um, 36 weeks pregnant um, with an egg donation from her sister um, and she, she says she hasn't told the rest of the family other than um, her parents and her husband's parents. Um, how do you how do you suggest that you then tell other members of the family about this process, especially grandparents? Um, I'm concerned about them not seeing my child in the same way. So to have kept secret until the baby's here, but wonder if there are better ways or resources available to help with this. Um, now, I think we'll go to perhaps to Nina first here, because I think this has got her name all over it, really. I think it has. Well, that's not my name, but certainly Donor Conception Network's name. Um, yeah, I would strongly recommend that that individual just contacts us at the office, ideally joins. We've got a lot of, uh, uh, well, we have a, a group of, of, um, of members who've used family as donors. So that could be a brother, sister, cousin, and uh, they they will be able to give you some support with this. We've got great resources, not necessarily specifically for having used a family member as a donor more, more broad, but you can integrate that part of the story as well. But just connecting with other people who've got perhaps slightly older children who've been through what you're 
facing uh, can be really reassuring and helpful. So yeah, please get in contact with us. Petra, would you want to chip in? Because you also look quite animated. <laughs> um, no, um, not really. I was thinking I, I did a study back some years ago with Professor Carol Smart about uh, families of donor conceived um, donors conceived children and, and talking to relatives and it was fascinating there because we talked both to parents and prospective parents but we also talked to relatives uh, and grandparents in particular and it was fascinating some of the parents that stand out more clearly was was sort of saying well we have told a grandmother say but uh, but she still says oh don't you look like your dad even though a sperm donor was involved so the the way in which older generations or you know two generations up or one generation up sort of deals with the f with what you're telling them may or may not surprise you uh, some some older generations you know have, have grown up and lived up in a time when what was seen to serve the child best was to keep this a secret and to keep emphasizing you know not to talk about donor conception so what we saw in that study was that you have these tensions between the parent generation who might be sort of part of the donor conception network and they really emphasize openness Whereas the grandparent generation might say, well, why do we need to tell? Really, what does it matter? We love this little boy, what does it matter? So you have these kinds of intergenerational tensions. But that's from the point of your research, that's not sort of personal advice to you. Um, do any of the other speakers want to come in on this? I do remember um, the um, other research that you did, because one of the things that will always stick with me is one of the grandparents saying, um, well, these children eat olives. Um, and because they'd used a Spanish donor and saying, you know, th that must be why none of our children would ever have thought about eating olives. And I did wonder that perhaps when their children were young, that whether olives were particularly widely available and very nice or very tinned. Um, but anyway, so we've got lots of questions. And the next one I'm going to take is for Natasha. Um, and it's quite a personal question. So if you want to pass, um, absolutely no problem. Um, but um, someone saying if you did make contact with your donor what kind of relationship um would you want and it's a bit difficult when you don't you've not met them <laughs> well yeah um i do think about that um i honestly don't know because it i think it would depend so much on um who he is you know where he is in that time of his life what i'm doing in that time of my life um i know from meeting my half sister the thing that really kind of bonded us and connected us was having things in common like we both were reading the same book the first time we met we both you know did work in the same fields of work uh we both have quite similar personalities um so i honestly would want to kind of kind of see what he's like see how he takes me and then take it from there you know be very open and flexible but also take things very slowly and a, and a, and a reasonable pace Great, thanks. Um, and I think that um, there's, unless anyone wants to chip in, well, I can't say anything on that. So um, the, there's also a question um, from Catherine Wade saying that um, you were talking about counting down um, um, till you were 18. Um, do you think that the legal rule that donor conceived children have to wait until they're 18 for identifying info. Do you think that that is a sensible rule or do you think that when donor conceived individuals are ready in terms of their capacity and maturity that they should be able to access that information? Um, and I suppose on the flip side of that, would you want, would you say the same thing if the parents didn't want their child to access the info? So it's quite a lot in that one. Yeah, I think that I understand why the age is 18, because, you know, that's kind of the arbitrary age we, that we understand being an adult in the UK. I would say I don't know how realistic that is now, given access to DNA testing. So as a 15 year old, 16 year old, you know, if you've got a debit card, you can buy it online. You've got some autonomy yourself. So I don't know if we're living in this um, kind of reality where you have no access to finding out anything until you're 18. Whether you should or not, I think that's very personal. For me, I was curious all the time. Um, and, but my mum put her foot down a few times, you know, when I had watched too much Veronica Mars, who was a teenage girl detective, and figured if we had just hired a teenage a detective to find out more, and, you know, she was like, no, you've got your, you know, standard grades in Scotland, so GCSEs coming up, let's put a pause on this now. So she, as the adult, had to was very supportive, but also had to kind of put the brakes on. 
Um, and looking back, I, I, I agree that that was the right thing to do, partly because the avenues I were exploring were extremely, um, it was extremely unlikely I would find anything. So it was the disappointment that she knew that I would have, that she was protecting me from. But now that there's access to DNA testing, I think that um, that disappointment won't necessarily be um, the result. So I think it's very different based on the child's home life, um, their feelings about being curious, and also what obviously makes the, the parent um, comfortable. I have to say, my mom was always very supportive and understood that the curiosity came from a very natural place. It wasn't undermining any strong family connections that, that we had and that we shared. And I felt I could always talk to her about it because of that. Great. Um, Natalie, I'd like you to come in on this one, actually, because, you know, there's the sort of that sort of legal element and you're always you're always one for wanting to change the law and the regulation. No, I've got a reputation, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's and Natasha is absolutely right that with the DNA testing, I think all of this you know, desire of the legal framework to control information and what's held and when it's accessed is likely to become increasingly redundant. So I think it's really important in that context to make sure that where people are making contact and making connections, that they are doing it in the best way and that they have access to support and counselling and you know, whatever is needed to make sure that that is as positive an experience for everybody involved as possible. Um, and I think it's really notable that we have this kind of arbitrary age of 18 but people you know donors don't have the option to say that they'd be happy to be contacted earlier so it's this kind of assumption that donors don't want to be involved and wouldn't we want to be around while a, a child is is still kind of formulating their own adult personality but actually that may not be the case so I think you know there's no reason why donors couldn't be contacted earlier if a donor conceived child was curious and said actually you know would you be happy for them to contact you and we can facilitate that as the HFEA or whoever is going to organize it so I think we need to be a bit more creative about how the law and regulation deals with all of these sorts of things. Great. Does anybody else want to chip in? I'm very conscious of um, not going to everybody. Um, so the next question is one for Petra, um, but it may be that Natalie comes in on this as well, actually, but um, which is um, from someone who's anonymous saying they were very interested to hear about your research. They were wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the toxicity um, you identified in some known donor relationships. Um, was there a consistency um, in this quality across your research participants relationships um, and were there uh, similarities or differences across gender or sexual orientation of the donors or parents involved so quite a lot in there for you to unpack yes I might need reminded of, of some of the details of that question thank you for that question that's a really interesting one um, no, there wasn't a lot of consistency, but in all cases, it was, as I mentioned in my presentation, it was tied in with the idea of the connection and the connection being an important one. And someone that we interviewed who stands out in that regard was a donor called Abby. And she even said in her interview, you know, if you talked to me a year ago, I would have told you a completely different story. But as it was, she was an egg donor to three different relationships, two of which had broken down completely within the last year. And she told us she was so, you know, when she started out, she really wanted to be a known donor. She was just sort of, she, she was someone who went from identity release donation to, to known donation because she really wanted that connection. She wanted those relationships, um, but it had then broken down. And we saw that um, it wasn't the overall experience. We also had donors, known donors who were just finding those relationships really rewarding and not, not at all toxic. But when things went wrong, because they are so they have this sort of charge this affinity to them when things go wrong it can really go really feel very very difficult and very kind of um um you know a bit like when a relationship with a sister goes wrong it can go you can't really sort of you can't just do away with that relationship and pretend like it doesn't exist anymore it is there and it is something and you kind of have to sort of carry on thinking about it so so that was the quality of it um, but interestingly also we found the relationships could pick up again so they could go wrong for a while and feel really difficult and then actually kind of um, come to an equilibrium that where people were quite happy again and were back in contact and sort of life had moved on a bit 
So the toxicity wasn't sort of there to sort of stay. And it wasn't just that it was either men or women who experienced that. It was sort of more a part of uh, these human relationships that did change, um, um, change over time. And it was very difficult to predict how they might change. Um, great. Um, so I think perhaps um, um, uh, Natalie and Erica might want to come in on this one. So um, I'll, I'll go to Natalie first. Yeah, I mean, we, we do sadly see this kind of toxicity sometimes in arrangements where things have gone wrong. Um, and I think they're very, very complicated emotionally. I mean, often if you have a situation where you have, let's say, a known father with a lesbian couple, you've got everybody feeling kind of very vulnerable. So, you know, often the non-birth mother is kind of feeling very anxious about not being seen as a real parent and kind of being on the periphery and the, the donor, if he's kind of overreaching boundaries is going to push her out and everybody's going to think that the, the child's parents are the donor and the mother. Um, so there's that kind of difficulty. And then from the donor's perspective, if they feel, if he feels that um, the parents are kind of excluding him, he's anxious about that, where that's going to go and whether he's going to lose contact and lose that relationship. So there's, you know, on both sides, I think a lot of emotional vulnerability that can make it incredibly charged and very difficult. Um, so I think this is where, you know, being mindful of everybody's vulnerabilities and expectations going into things is, is really important. And I think as well, we've seen in a few cases, situations where um, gay and single men in particular have opted for known donation because they see it as a way of becoming a parent, having not kind of fully appreciated that they really do want to be fully involved parents. Um, and perhaps that's sometimes to do with how difficult it is to find a surrogate or how expensive surrogacy is and that those other options are not so easily available. So they go into this as kind of the easy option. And then when the child's born, they get, I think one judge called it being assaulted by biology where you know they don't expect to feel the way that they expected to feel and so you know that's really difficult so i think in, in increasing accessibility to all forms of family building so that people can make really open choices about what they want and then follow that through is is really important and erica would you like to come in on this one and sort of the perhaps the experiences you've seen across pride angel um different relationships and if, um, when things perhaps have gone wrong I couldn't agree more with Natalie. Um, the, the donor that I spoke about, donor number two, um, the one that Natalie Gamble um, actually went through with the donor agreement and told us um, he wants a co-parenting arrangement, he was gay. Um, I always thought we'd have a gay donor and the, the donor that we have, the father of our daughter, he is actually heterosexual. Um, I, I didn't really know what to anticipate to begin with and I think that um, Natalie, uh, as hit the nail on the head with, with regards to some uh, gay men possibly wanting to go into that avenue. Um, I think the most important thing from my point of view for anybody looking at um, going down the route of using a known donor is communication. Um, if I was talking properties, I'd be saying location, 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 but we're talking fertility. It's communication, communication, communication. And our letter of intent, I felt really helped us so when we wrote down everything, um, everything that we anticipated, you can't anticipate everything, it's just not possible. But we wrote down everything to, so he could understand what he would get out of um, the relationship with being a donor. Um, and I think that was helpful. Great. Um, thanks, Erica. So I'm going to move on to the next question. I'm going to perhaps um, mash up a couple here, but um, we're going to use Fiona Duffy's question to sort of lead into it. And that's, um, she said, one of the newspaper articles on Nat in Natasha's slides refers to the sperm donor as a donor, um, as a father. Um, does Natasha consider her donor to be a father? Um, and if so, would this be common among some or all donor conceived children um, and also I think it was interesting because um, Erica in your presentation you know um, how you refer to your donor as daddy um, and um, his parents as grandparents so I think it would be interesting actually to hear from all the speakers on this one so I'm going to go to Natasha first. Yeah it's quite interesting when I um, spoke to journalists and was interviewed about this I made it quite clear that I consider him a donor and that was a bit of an evolution of terminology for me growing up because, you know, I was the only person I knew in my circumstance. I was, I was kind of 
making it up as, as I went along and was trying to see what word felt right. Uh, father didn't feel right for me once I understood that dynamic a little bit better when I was older in primary school. Donor quickly became the colloquial that we used. But the interviewers, the sensationalist headline of like, will I ever meet my father? That's more grabbing than donor. And also a lot of people, the, the term donor um, is maybe unknown to them. Um, so there was a bit of a mix of reason why father's included in the media headlines. Um, but I think it's very, again, a really personal uh, thing. What, what makes, what feels right for that family, for that child. And also that, that feelings can change as you grow up, as you um, kind of become more aware of yourself and as you kind of understand where you fit and there's no kind of right or wrong way to feel about any of this. Great, so I'm now going to go to Petra because I'm, I'm interested to know what you've learned in your Curious Connections project about the, the different terms that people have used perhaps. Um, so, in, in terms of interviewing donors, uh, as I said in my presentation, they're, they're, they have a really, really strong moral sense of not wanting to step on the parents' toes. So many of the known donors spoke really carefully about uh, choosing the right kind of words. They were also talking, you know, they were sort of saying that they were really quite relieved when the baby didn't look like them, you know, when they could kind of see the baby and sort of, go, oh, thank goodness it hasn't got my eyes or something, because they didn't want the idea that they maybe were parents or that they could sort of step over into that relationship so they were really there was a real sort of um no sort of moral guide which is really fascinating because obviously the people that we spoke to don't know each other at all so there's a real but there is a real sort of strong sense that donors do not see themselves as parents and so the, the absolute vast majority would never um say that they were that they would see themselves as fathers or mothers of those donors that we spoke to um and um, Erica, if we go for you next, and you know, perhaps just if you're comfortable to do so, show why you re refer to your um, your donor as daddy. I think from from our personal perspective, we didn't want our daughter to feel any different. Um, I also have brought up my my wife's daughter from the age of four. Um, she's now 21. So with her being at school, she always knew she had two mums and a dad. And I think that that made her more comfortable at school. Um, in, in some respects, she was, um, some kids were actually jealous of her having two mums, which was, uh, which is kind of nice. <laughs> but no, I, I think well. social norm of everybody talking, I mean, our daughter watches Peppa Pig and you've got Daddy Pig. And for that context of the word from such a young age, she understands that, that children have a mum and a dad. And just to, to call him dad, although she doesn't see him regularly, for us, that just felt comfortable. Great. And Nina, do you want to come in on this one? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, what I would add to this, because everything been said uh, very clearly and very well already, um, is that we would probably like a bit of focus on the child because I think that parents and adults can make their own decisions and have all the great plans that they want and use the terminology that they want but there will come a point where children will take charge of that and make their own decision and they may decide they want to call the person dad or not um, and they may find their own language so I guess the the initial the initial intention is to be clear with expectations isn't it and that's why we're trying to separate out the language because that word dad has or mum indeed has a lot of uh, hidden depth and meaning around what your commitment is to the child what your relationship is to the child and if that isn't what you're bringing then it's a bit of a big word to be on your shoulders um, but I think it ultimately it probably has to be the child or you know the young person's decision on how they want to refer to those individuals yeah so nina i'm going to ask you to come back quickly on a, a, a short question um from ruth yudkin um and she wants to know are there statistics on the number of children born from known donation versus identity release i think think there must be but I'm not the right person um, we need the HFEA here really to to give us that information maybe someone else in, in on the panel is aware well, 
I might give my chair's prerogative. Yeah, I can see Natalie's just, unmuted. Go on. I was just going to say, even if there are, I think it would give a really incomplete picture because so many can see through home yeah. insemination and outside clinics. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so then I'm looking at the time and we're going to take this one next from Tracy Sainsbury. So um, she says this is for Erica, but I think this is something that perhaps other people can chip in on as well, is that she says sadly clinics often have known donors and people hoping to conceive attending who've met online and not taken any time to get to know each other um, and have not had any legal advice or counselling and although most clinics have mandatory counselling for known donor arrangements not all do um, how can how can these services be improved she wants to know how clinics can make it easier for people with known donation um, so as Natalie um, you're still uh, large on my screen. I'll let you go first on this. Um, I, I think, I mean, it goes to everything we've said all evening. It's just about encouraging people to kind of step back and take their time accessing counselling, getting legal advice, you know, making sure that they put things in writing or whatever the process needs to be to make sure that they've kind of prepared properly before they forge ahead with the exciting process of trying to conceive. Um, so I think it's just you know, clinics being, you know, understanding of the fact they're coming in very enthusiastic, but gently encouraging people sometimes to put the brakes on and, and just go a bit slower. And Erica, I'm going to come to you for next on this one, because this will be our last question. It's such a difficult one. It would be lovely if the HFEA could provide some guidance for the fertility clinics to say this is what they, they must do. Um, even if they were to go back to the, um, the recipient and donor and say, go away if you take some time take a couple of months before you come back to us for the uh for the treatment you know i i would have no qualms if they were to to go back and say that to people i think that there has to be some sort of um getting to know one another with a known donor because it's a lifetime connection yeah um petra i'm gonna invite you to come on next on this one what we found in the study was that there was a really interesting group of donors who who so if you think about the, having a lot of conversations with seeing counsellors and, and writing letters and so on as a protective sort of way of dealing with the risk of known donation, we saw quite a substantial group of known donors who did the exact opposite. They were almost staying as anonymous as they possibly could. They wouldn't change, they wouldn't tell their last name, they wouldn't tell them their address. They dealt with the risks a little bit like identity release donation. It was just the fact that they had met the recipients. So often they would have an email address that wasn't actually reflecting their real name and so on. So, so to sort of to think that the only way to do this is to provide lots of counselling and talking and so on. Um, what people are doing isn't necessarily that and it doesn't necessarily seem to make it the outcome a lot worse you know there are different routes to go down and people are doing are using different routes quite successfully um you know depending on how they decide to do things yeah um nina have you got anything um to add i'm very conscious of the time now we're getting really close to the end um just i mean just encouraging i, I, I... I don't know, it's communication, encouraging preparation, thinking about the child and the long view of that family. Uh, I think it's just sort of the, 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 the same messages that come across um, through the whole evening. Yeah. Um, Natasha, do you want to have the final word from the panel before I wrap up the event? <laughs> Yeah, I would just like to say that I'm really encouraged that these events are becoming more frequent and that I think it's important now that donor conceived people are adults and as they find out more and, and they're involved in these conversations going forward. So I really appreciate it. 